So, um, our next panel will uh, debate the merits of upping the online video ad load. Uh, as I noted earlier, the average ad load for online video per comm score is one uh, minute of ads for every 72 minutes of content, which is, uh, falls well short of television's one ad for every three and a half minutes or so of content. Anyway, as uh, more and more short and long form video content is consumed across web-enabled devices, the question is, should publishers reflect on upping the ad load? So to lead this discussion, we've sort of somewhat ironically asked a publisher that serves an awful lot of short, -term, uh, short form videos uh, to frame this debate. So please welcome to the stage MetaCafe CEO Eric Hockenberg and uh, his panel. Thank you, Eric. Eric and his pips. <laughs> Good afternoon. Wait, is this on? Good afternoon. Um, I'm trying to think of a joke for um, upping the ad load, but I don't have one. So um, <laughs> it, 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 we're, we're all glad to be here. Um, it, we're going to let, I want to have each of us introduce ourselves. Um, I, as mentioned, I'm Eric Hackenberg, uh, CEO of MetaCafe, have been in the uh, short form video industry for um, approaching five years now, um, watching lots of transformation over that time frame, obviously watching the evolution of the advertising space, the pre-roll space in particular, um, with lots of interest. And uh, it seems that there's still many open questions about it. And uh, that's what we're looking forward to talking about today. So uh, Joanna, why don't you introduce yourself quickly? Sure. Hi, I'm Joanna Abel. I run marketing at Freewheel. We're a video technology company um, doing business with the largest producers and distributors of content. So my lens for this discussion is really about professional rights managed content and how ad loads are changing um, in and around that content. Mark stole half my stuff, by the way. Hi, Keith Panici. I um, am the general manager of the springboard division of Gorilla, which is an evolved media company. And we are a video technology platform that helps to uh, enable the publishing of content, video content, uh, video player and content management system. Um, and I started my online video life watching videos on your site. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of continuing to watch it evolve into uh, what it's becoming today. Hi, my name is John Ellister. I am at the, I head up research and development for Cadreon, and um, we are the trading desk arm for media brands and IPG as a whole. And um, our approach to this discussion is going to be one of audience play and how the audience helps decide um, and how they vote depicts the direction we take in the industry. Great, and I'm Eli Goodman. I am the media evangelist at Comscore. It's my actual title. They let me make it up. That's how it's going to work. Uh, I'm just in charge of you know our entire what's called our our product expertise division. Comscore, we're great in the world of statistics. You know anything quantitative, I got it for you. Uh, but my gr my group and myself, we're here to help our clients figure out how to actually make use of those statistics. So for everything today, I'm your numbers guy. I'm sure you've got to, you've heard our name a few times this morning. So. I'll try not to geek out too much. It's always good to have an evangelist on the panel. He's our go-to guy if, we go, if it goes quiet. Um, so when we were talking um, in preparation for this panel, uh, you know, the first question I think that came to our minds is, um, while upping the ad load is a great business question for us all, probably the, the more important question is, what is the optimal uh, video ad load, right? What is, what is the right ad load um, to maximize the experience, the dollars, to make it all work? And as we started thinking about that, there's, I think, a lot of different points of view about, obviously, length of content, quality of content, context of content, user experience, um, that really draw to, draw to mind what is the right value proposition. CPM, of course, lots of different variables about that. But so with that in mind, and with that sort of the, the idea behind this panel, um, Eli, why don't, why don't you start off with a few stats just to set us up in terms of what is happening in the video ad space right now? Yeah, uh, really, the odds? I'm, I'm on for the stats. <laughs> now, a couple <laughs> things I'll tell you guys. If you think about in the United States right now, Call it 215 million people online or so. About 86% of those watch a video any given day, right? You're talking about both ad videos and content videos. About 161 million of those people view videos on YouTube, 30 million on Hulu. Uh, but in fact, if you think about you know, ads across the internet, let's use YouTube as an example. On YouTube, less than half a percent 
of all of the videos that are viewed are, uh, you know, are, are actual ads. And that statistic we talked about earlier, I mean, for every, you know, 72 minutes of content that's being consumed, one minute of ads are being watched versus, think about television, right? The standard ad load, call it 20, you know, let's call it 20 to 30 minutes, right? Oh, maybe 20 minutes, give or take, depending upon what you're watching. So uh, suffice to say, like my position here is there's a lot of room to be had as it relates to number of ads, time of ads, type of ads, people that will watch ads, all that type of stuff. And Joanna, you had mentioned that you've, you do a survey every so often and have some data we want to share with the team with, this, with the audience here as well. Yeah, sure. We do. Uh, we produce a quarterly report, so it's aggregated data across all of our customers using our system, including Turner, ESPN, Discovery, um, most of the major content owners and distributors. Um, and you know, for any of you who were in the room during Mark's session, he was talking about, you know, initially as an industry, we set an expectation that if you're a consumer and you want to watch video free online, you can do so with no ads or maybe one ad. And so what we're seeing from our customers over time is an increasing attempt to creep back closer to, to a TV-like ad load that really stands a chance at helping them um, afford the kind of quality content they're producing. So specifically, uh, Q1 and Q2 this year, again, across all of our customers, for long-form content, the average number of video ads in that content was three. Um, and just literally hot off the presses earlier, uh, late last week, uh, we got the Q3 data, and that number's now up to five. And so what you're seeing, and, and again, substantiated by the anecdotes that Mark was sharing and that they're doing at CBS, um, what you're seeing are those, those ad loads creeping back up closer to, to TV-like. And the hope on our end, of course, is that it's not at the expense of completion rates, meaning consumers being wa willing to actually watch through those ads. And so far, what we're seeing is, on average, those completion rates holding steady at about 82%. So um, good news for all of us who, uh, who hope to make money from the continued existence of advertising and professional content. So let's, let's, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper on this, because I think you know, maybe one of the most interesting things is just how different the ad load is from a short form provider like YouTube and on the other extreme, Hulu, which is, you know, I, it, it, they, they serve far more. I always think it's funny, because I think sure. it's, it was a real insight, right, when they when Comscore started breaking out ad load versus content load, and it turned out 80% of, 75% of what Hulu was showing in terms of ad views, or video views, were ad views, right? Yeah, I mean, it, listen, you know, a lot of that, if you think about it, it's, there's a difference between number of ads that are being shown, and then length of, you know, amount of time that's being spent. So, again, I think I mentioned before, less than half a percent of, all the time and videos viewed on YouTube are going to be ads. Uh, but on Hulu, it's about seven, let's say out of every, it's about 7.7% mm -hmm. these days, give or take. And in fact, the only entertainment network that I could think of that has like a regular ad load is CW, right? You know, that's, you see, you're talking, you know, about one quarter, right, of every hour, 15, you know, 15 minutes, give or take. Um, but also the, the big difference is between all videos and then premium. Right, so if you think about out of all videos, it's about 1.3%. I told you guys I would make you throw up with stats, right? <laughs> so about 1.3% of all videos that are viewed are ads. Uh, of course, heavily dominated by something like YouTube. But even in premium content, it's still only 8.5%. And John and Alistair, you, we were talking earlier this week as well, and, and you mentioned that you know, the, the point about optimal, right? And you're a very data-centric organization, and you know, is optimal upping the ad load, or is there more to it than that? Well, the, the fantastic, <clears throat> the opportunity for Cadreon that, that we see in, in exploring these new avenues of, of upping the time spent is it's, we just see it as another vertical. We just see it as another segment. <clears throat> just because, say, 75% of, of the audience is going to dislike upping, up, upping the length it doesn't mean that we should just cater to the 75%. So the, the approach that Cadreon takes is, is we, we actually just look at the intention of the customer and the consumer and see what they do. And that, that gives us a fantastic opportunity to then deliver the long form content potentially to that segment of users that will consume it. So it's, we, we don't have to choose. We, we don't have to be put in a position where we have to pick either or. All we have to do is really pay attention to the audience and actually pay attention to, to their intention and then focus on what they want and, and how they want to see it. Yeah, I, and that's that's a very important point. I think. I mean, one of the things that you hear you're hearing today with a lot of panels and, and presentations, and you hear a lot outside of this room is com comparisons to t television, right? I mean, there's a reason why you know TiVo was invented. I mean, people just got 
they didn't want to watch those commercials and this great invention came out, allowed them to skip these commercials, right? The web can't make that same mistake in sort of trying to mimic everything that TV is doing and you know what, what, what was just said about using the power of data and the power of the measurement tools you have that you didn't have offline um, to segment your audience, target them you know, appropriately um, and not just try to turn up you know, instead of one pre-roll, it's now two, it's now three, it's now four. Use innovative ad units, use short bumpers, use things that in, are engaging to the consumer and not annoying to the consumer. And I think if you listen to the, the, the publishers who know their audience best, who've been able to build that audience because of the, the publishing abilities they have, and try to target programs around what they think is good, I think there's a, a greater win for everybody in terms of potential dollars to flow online from that. I was just, yeah, I was just going to tag onto that. Um, I think what you're going to see, especially now, what we're seeing now, and, and hopefully over time, you see a merger of the best of television and the best of what digital can offer coming together. I mean, I think the reality, again, at least on the professional video side, is that um, you know the legacy TV models aren't just legacy; they're lucrative. They make billions of dollars for decades, and so um, you know those models, I think, are going to be preserved until um, many of these companies continue to test alternative and additional revenue streams to continue to make up that incremental do those incremental dollars so that the quality of content can be preserved. But I don't disagree. I mean, I think over time what you're going to see is, is hopefully the best of what TV can offer combined with the best of what innovation and, and um, addressability, targeting, all that stuff that digital can offer into you know, what will essentially be the new world of TV. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. For, in terms of the advertiser, from the advertiser level, disruption is difficult, and disruption of something lucrative and something that requires so much education and, and, and risk is very difficult. And so it's going to take, you know, there's a lot of noise out there right now. There's 100 ad networks. There's 100 publishers. That noise is creating a little bit of chaos, but it's also creating, you know, test budgets and um, things that work and, you know, increased budgets after that test. And so we're kind of figuring it out, and I absolutely agree with you that at some point we're going to get this hopefully massive move to, toward online because it does offer so much more than, than what traditional forms uh, offered before. I, I, I think one of, one of the really interesting facts we're facing right now is, is a lot of the, the content that's been created for online has been generally pushed through from, from broadcasting. So, you know, they, they shove us the 15 second, they shove us the 30 second that they repurpose from, from TV and they go, make it work. And, and so we have. We've, we've built industries, we've built ideas, we've built optimization all around that. Does that mean it's optimal? I would, I would categorically state no. Um, so this is a fantastic time for us to try new things, to see what the consumers, what is their threshold. Um, and different properties, uh, the attention span might be this big. Uh, they don't want to spend 15 seconds on an ad if there's going to be 25 seconds of content. Certain, certain areas, they, they will be prepared to take longer if, if the content is there. And, and I think it's less a discussion about professional content or, or UGC because there's obviously value in both. It's more about understanding the end consumer, understanding the end user, and actually giving them that experience they want. And I, I feel that we, we should be a little bit brass in, in pushing that envelope. And I know a lot of the dollars are being pushed through in a lot of the media creation, and that's why it is so exciting that, that some of the people on this panel, they are driving the creation of the content that's made for the digital consumption that we use. That's the exciting part, because we can try something new. and and and. You know, the, the end user, the, the consumer votes with intention. And we don't have to, to wait seven months and 25 panels later. We give it six hours, six minutes later, and, and they will tell you, this is not working. Show me something different. So it's, 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 a, it's an exciting time. Yeah, and I think one of the, you know, as we talked, I think one of the themes here, right, is that digital and television are different. And one of the underlying ideas behind digital is that you actually have a higher level of engagement, whether because you can't skip or, um, there are fewer ads, you know, so what you really are talking about an optimization issue. But it's also for the advertiser side, right, in terms of what's the value proposition. We, we review our numbers daily at MediCafe, and, and if we see the performance metrics declining, we look at how we're serving the ads, right, and how do we change that um, and react immediately, because our advertisers will complain, right? They'll come back to us and say, hey, why isn't this working? Why isn't this campaign working, right? That, that the, campaign, the team that delivers campaigns is monitoring daily to make sure. So I, it, that's why I think the optimal question is so important, which is, you know, 
it's, it's the whole thing, right? The thing we don't like to talk about, which is television has a lot of ads and we don't, we don't watch a lot of those ads, right? Um, and that's sort of built into the habit of television and it still works, absolutely, most powerful marketing medium we know today, but it's, but it's not because every ad is valuable. And in, in digital, you, you do pay attention more to the ads, but you know, am I the only person that if, if um, Hulu says it's gonna be two minutes of ads that I have to flip away and do something else, even turn off the volume sometimes? Where if it's 15 seconds, I don't. It's, it, you know, I think, so how do you, do you see that in the, are, are there ways to measure that, track that? You know, how do you optimize to preserve the value in digital and not compromise to a, a model that isn't always working right in television? So that's, actually, that's a great point, and that was where I was going to go next, is that you could easily spend all day worrying about what the consumer wants, right? And that's, I mean, as important as anything, right? The customer's always right. But also, let's not forget it's about, you have to explain to an advertiser what's the effectiveness of all of this, right? It's not just about reach. It's not just about impressions. I mean, you think about television has analytics that go back, what, 70 years, give or take, that they've had of, of sample size and people and how well things work and all those big brand dollars that spend all the money. But we're in a relatively nascent stage here as it relates to online metrics. Now, gotten much better, right? Certainly the, the effectiveness and the ability to overlay the three screens and the impact of all that stuff has gotten much better, uh, whether it be stuff that we do or other companies, right? I mean, anybody out there, there's a lot of things uh, for you to be able to investigate and analyze, but you have to be able to prove to what are your advertisers, how well that stuff is working. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. You can't just toss it and be like, well, it's online video, people watch it. They're like, yeah, but do they actually like it? Do they engage? What do they do? Do they turn away from the TV or turn away from their screen? I mean, all those different types of things. So just think of it as like this little dance between you as a, let's say your advertisers, you as a distributor, and then you know the consumers and how it's all interacting. Well, that's, that's one of the pitfalls we sit in because if, if we keep on standing up and say, you know, pick me, pick me, don't, don't, don't spend money on TV, it's going to work for you, let's get a little bit of the crumbs. They go fantastic, here's some, but you keep on saying you have data, so prove to me that worked. Well, you're holding us to the same metrics that you're doing TV, but... So it is a bit of a chicken and the egg, and, and that, that's why I think this is such a fantastic opportunity for us to, to reinvent in some way or... or to come up with, with a way to use that data to show the benefit at the end of the day um, to our clients to say, this is what you got for spending your money. And, and that's why it's a good idea to split your, pan, your, your, your plan up in this way. And that, that also requires not just on the vendor side and the, and the, you know, the advertising provider side, but also on the, on the media buyer side to not just be open to seeing the data, but to make it a condition or part of the overall relationship and, and not only share us taking the data we share with them but also sharing with us what data they're they're seeing so we can better optimize i mean there's there's so many ways to optimize for engagement there's the most rudimentary just go after context there's there's the vast you know mining of data through various providers and 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 all those have some level of effectiveness it's just all about kind of finding the things that blends the best for the message you're trying to deliver. Um, so definitely, the data is important to create, and there's companies out there that are doing a good job of it. I think now the next level is for us to push the use of it and the the you know to to to, to measure ourselves by that data. So let's let's tie this back to the, the last Q and A where Mark was saying, uh, speaking as the as the company that pays for the content, right? Because I think it's true, right? Obviously. If, as an advertiser, if you can afford it, you'll take the one ad, right? It's a, it's a good deal. The consumer likes that, too. But I think the other driving force is that the publishers, right, those of us who want to make money from it, would like to have as, and make as much money as possible. And that's where the real optimization comes in. Um, how, how do you increase value, or how do the CPMs reflect increased value for us if, um, other than just increasing the ad load? Is ad, I mean, is it just ad load, or what other factor? Can we, are you seeing tangible examples of a higher price so we can afford a lower ad load? Yeah, I mean, listen, if you have, if you can actually say to somebody, the only people that watch these videos are 18 to 24 year old males that live in this particular part of the country, again, I don't want to draw it all back to stats, but that's getting back to that effectiveness. If you have an ability to both quantify and qualify your particular audience, it doesn't necessarily have to be about bigger. Right, it's all about incremental. So if you're able to say, listen, you guys reach as many people through TV as you can see if you cross-reference with us, you'll not only be able to make it bigger, but think about it, you don't just get one impression per person, right? The more impressions, 
the more stuff, and the, you know, the eventual latent responses that you're looking for. So I think it's also important to think about the huge thing that we see, it's about engagement, right? The consumption by, there's not necessarily a lot more people watching online video or television at any given time. It's how often, you know, are they actually consuming your stuff? So you got to come up with a way in order to define that for said advertisers. And yeah, and Kevin, both Joanna and Keith, you, you give flexibility to the publishers to choose how many ads. What insights do you have in terms of how they make those trade-offs? Sure. I mean, with us, absolutely. So the, the, the platform allows the publisher to choose their ad load, and they can choose zero. Um, they can choose to flood, the, to flood their content with ads. And it, to, what we're seeing is that you know, there are publishers who are not money-driven, but they're the minority, right? So most people need to monetize their content. And so they are, you know, what's accepted is the, you know, prior to content pre-roll. That, that, you know, that 15 second preferably, but even 30 second slot is acceptable. That's what everybody likes. And, and, and to, to grow that, you can either do one of two things. You can grow the amount of content that's out there and the amount of views that you're getting off of multiple pieces of content, or try to find more innovative ways to get more ad views for that piece of content. So something that we think uh, works, although it's, it's not as easy to execute on, will get easier as time passes, is integrated forms of advertising. So you know, a pre-roll that's interactive, that has um, the ability for the, the, the viewer to interact with that unit directly within the screen or off-site through some microsite or, or, or game that, that ties to that pre-roll. That drives longer engagement without upping the ad load to an unwanting user, right? So that's that's the type of things that online allows us to do um, that we've experimented with to some success um, to date. Yeah, I think in terms of some of the, the successes we're seeing uh, our customers deploy, I think um, in general, I mean, of course, none of them is running a charity. They're running a business. But I think a lot of how do they make more money is about how do they sell a better product to their advertisers. And so... In a way, in this discussion, even my own statistics, we do a little bit of a disservice by making it sound like there's a pre-roll, a mid-roll, and a post-roll. Um, a lot of the creativity and a lot of the how do we get higher CPMs from our advertisers for our business is coming into um, how we're allowing our how our customers are choosing to program the different pods of ads throughout a given piece of content. You heard Mark talking about it's not just a pre-roll and then the classic middle of the content break. It's multiple pods and sets of pods and um, the way we're seeing them experiment with that to create more value is, you know, if you're Coke and you want to be able to say not just I want to run once every pod with a different ad, but I want to run first in every pod and I don't want Pepsi to be allowed to run next to me, those kinds of sponsorships and exclusivities are, are ways that we're seeing our customers get more creative with those pods as it relates to linear video advertising that, um, that I think is creating more value to those advertisers. They see that as compelling and for which they can charge more money. Uh, I, I think Keith and Joanna pointed out something um, that, that's really interesting. I guess take this coming from somebody that's in R&D, but um, we have the ability to, to try new things and we have the ability to, to not really alienate <clears throat> the majority of our, of, of our audiences or on our networks to actually try new things and see how it works. And, and, and we, can, we can literally blow the ideas all the way up from just working with, with our clients, or as she mentioned with Coke or with Pepsi, to, to, to really come up with new, new innovative ideas to, to reach our audience and see how it plays. But we, different from, from TV, we could actually do that on a very small scale, but yet have large enough quantifiable data to, to go back and say, wow, we should really pay attention to this. And yet we can also try something that might fail horribly, but we won't run the risk of losing our audience data and, and our audience business. So it's it's fantastic to see companies like that taking the risk to drive, I guess, where we need to be a few years from now. Yeah, one thing which we don't do a lot of, but I see I've seen other uh, companies do that I think could be interesting and, and move us in the right direction in terms of upping the ad load without forcing it on is the way that advertising and content is, is merging together. Um, and not just brand entertainment, you know, placement, product placement within video, but also just advertising that is entertaining. And TV's done a phenomenal job in the last five years of making advertising more entertaining, I feel. Um, and on, in the online world, you're having a lot of brands test the type of you know, ad content that people want to see online, the viral type content, the, you know, I saw one recently, I think it was State Farm, where, you know, it, the video was simply a guy throwing a Frisbee that hugged the wall and then landed in a trash can, and then there was some 
clever gimmicky slogan at the end that tied it to the brand. Um, that is something that people are able to distribute for brands as content. And if, you, if you're showing something as content and it's entertaining, you're more likely to be able to get broader distribution. And there's companies, I mean, Visible Measures, and a couple of the companies that are playing with models um, that do this. And I think that could be interesting for, for us. Yeah, and I, and I guess one of the, I mean, to, to sort of take the, 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 again, the, the balance of this to the, the other direction, right? You have uh, the idea of the paper view that the advertiser only pays when they had it viewed. You see, um, I guess it's being implemented by YouTube, which is maybe the one company trying to reduce the ad load with their commandment that you skip the ad at, at you know five or ten seconds in. But I mean, how do you mean? How much is this? Are, are we willing to give the user control and actually intentionally lower the the uh, the ad load? Is that is that? I you know I'll tell you it, it was interesting. Uh, you know, Mark from CBS made a good point about how we're training you know, the people at home to feel more comfortable with seeing less ads than they're stuck with on television and opting out, you know, of watching the entire ad and that type of thing. I'm telling you that people's tolerance for much more advertising is, it's, it's open season. You could absolutely be pushing on them much stronger. And I think that you are training people with those types of things, allowing them to shut it down or to skip or just only serving one ad per show or every you know, show unit or things like that. Like as an industry, I'm telling you that there is a lot more opportunity. And, and by all means, I mean, we see it you know, in all the observations from you know, number of ads, people that are viewing them, how long they're viewing them, that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I should have started this by saying it, it, there's people in the audience that will vouch for me. I'm a digital native. I'm not a TV person, much though it sounds like um, I come from that space. But I mean, at the risk of sounding, saying maybe the most obvious thing anybody will say on this panel all afternoon, I mean, we all know that advertising comes down to how relevant you can be to that user. And I think certainly relevance is one of the best attributes of digital. Um, knowing the data we have and the attributes we know about that user, how do we deliver more relevant advertising? And I think w one of the areas that we all continue to be challenged by given some of these models that are trying to come together is, you know, is the aggravation because there's 60 seconds of ads or is the aggravation because you're making me watch, you know, a mortgage ad when I am not in the housing market, a car ad when I just bought a car, you know, a jockstrap ad, and I think that goes without saying. I mean, so the point is, I mean, I know we all know this in this room, but I, I think some of the, the consumer aggravation we've suffered from, you know, in the past several years as it relates to video advertising really has to do with not taking advantage of the relevance that, that digital can lend to that experience. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the fundamental premise of, at least from Caravan, we see the length of the ad as just being another vertical. It's being another opportunity to, to find out, does that work for that set of audience? And I, I'm not in the business to guess. I, I don't have to guess. We, we look at the data, and they will, will tell you that that set of audience likes it, and this set does not. And, and it's the same as showing a certain ad that's not relevant. And it, and it goes as far as the creative portion of it, from the messaging to the type of the ad, to the placement, to the audience. I mean, it's, the, these are all segments that, that we have to, to pay attention to, to, to find out what is the right ad at the end of the day to show the audience. So John, I'll start. just following up on that, the relevance thing, I, I think it's an interesting question. Is it, when you think about relevance, are you thinking about the advertiser saying it's relevant or the consumer saying it's relevant? Because I think they're very different. It is right? absolutely two different things. I mean, we, I, I don't know if I should say this out loud, but, but a lot of the clients we, we do deal with, they have a very specific picture in mind who the audience is. And, and m many cases, we, the data, not we, the, the data proves them wrong. We actually tell, you, tell them that based on the people that interacted with you, it's actually a completely different segment. And so we could be stubborn and stick to the segments that, that, that the clients want. Um, and we could say, or you could actually move it to the people that does engage with your brand. And so it, it, to your point, absolutely, it, it doesn't always align at all. And so the, the intentions, and, and we just need to play the middle ground where we say, focus on the data. Just follow the data, follow where the people are, and keep on trying to make the advertising and the experience as relevant as, as we can. Um, so yeah, that. you know, a great thing to add there. I'll give you like a real world example of this exact kind of thing. Everybody here is familiar with the world's most interesting man, right? We've seen that, right? The Dosa Keys guy, my hero. But then we also, we're all familiar with the old Spice guy, 
right? Everybody, you're shaking your heads. So when you're talking about audience, like if I just sat down and thought about it, I'd say, well, what's relevant for that? That's both for men, right? It's for men. But the old Spice guy, in fact, was three times as popular as far as videos and stuff because it targeted women. Like where they were delivering that and how they served the ads and, you know, the type of creative. It's really about women. And it's, even though they're, you know, it might be about like men's grooming products and whatnot, it's the women that buy them. Right, so that's just, I'm just pointing that out, that the, the creative as much as me just looking at it, uh, totally thought it was all for dudes. You know, I'm a dude, I'm like, I'm a dude, I appreciate it, I drink beer, I'm happy with that. But in fact, the Old Spice thing was all about women. And it still is, I mean, that's definitely like the direction and who they're going after. So remember about the creative and then matching it up. You know, it, it could be completely different than you just think on its surface. I'd like to say that I buy my own deodorant. Yeah, I would like to say I do not buy my husband's deodorant, <laughs> for the record. Hey, but I'm sure you're right. Just say <laughs> No, I think relevance is interesting, right? Because, um, you know, I, I think who's the one asking, at, you know, the consumer, is it relevant? And, you know, and I know my 15-year-old daughter, th daughter thinks that every 15-second ad is relevant and every one-minute ad is not relevant. That's her message back every time. I, yes, no, yes. But, um, but even like the car thing, you just bought a car. But if I want to change your mind five years from now when you buy a car again, don't I have to do it now? Right, don't have to start sending that message. Is it always the consumer who decides, or is it the advertiser who's deciding? Well, who do I want to get this message to? If if you look at a situation like that, is is you keep on serving an ad and she doesn't interact with it, she doesn't show no intention. She tells you she's not interested. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's just just pay attention to the data. And and I mean, there is there is a, a great amount of companies out there that that has fantastic data sets and. Uh, you know, we, we, we collect some portion of data working with, with our clients. Um, but it's when you bring it all together and you actually look at it holistically and you can actually get the picture of what the intention is, um, it starts to make sense. And you, and, and you have to be very careful not to go at the end of the day and go, well, I'm going to sell it to a guy. I'm going to sell it to a girl because that's what marketing says. Um, just, just pay attention to what the end user wants at the end of the day and you probably can't go wrong. Uh, we can keep talking, but if there are any questions, why don't you grab a microphone and we'll call on you in a minute. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, at the risk of contradicting myself a little bit, I, I do feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, and Eli mentioned this earlier, you know, I do think there's a there's a line, and I don't know that any of us knows exactly where it is yet, about listening to the consumer versus actually being able to execute on the businesses we're all trying to run, whether you're an advertiser who's booked X number of impressions and expects Y amount of delivery, and the publisher who committed in that contract to deliver that, and, you know, all of a sudden, you're in a situation where you're giving the customer, the consumer, or the viewer the option to opt out, opt out of advertising. And if you're, I'm making stuff up, I hope I'm not offending anyone, you know, you're Lysol and you're up against Audi and Porsche every time, you know, how do you actually deliver on that contract and, and give those impressions to your advertiser? So I do think there's a line of wanting the consumer and the viewer to feel empowered and to feel like they have a say in the experience given how personal it is online, but still finding a balance there with being able to run the business we're all trying to run. Are there any questions? Uh, anybody? Uh, uh, a little bit to drive a little bit of provocativeness here. I know Eli, you're saying put more ads in front. Do the, do the rest of the panel here? Do you actually think that we should be upping the ad load? Yes. <laughs> it, in a smart way, yes. I, I would say absolutely, and see what happens. Um, <laughs> they will tell you if it doesn't work, and then, quickly, and then pay quickly. attention. They will tell you quickly too. Yeah. yeah in I some mean, areas, it's definitely going to work. I. I I have, I have no preconception to think that long ads won't work. Um, there's one thing you, you learn in our space is, is we have a very vast majority of users that use us. There, there's going to be a niche for it, and I absolutely think we should explore it, and, and if it works, do it. And I mean, I was being a little cheeky and just saying yes, but I mean, I think... She serves ads as, <laughs> as a business. That's Not personally. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, no, in all sincerity, though, I mean, the companies that make headlines are the ones that unilaterally say, we're going to do the exact same ad load, it's going to be full board and live with it. And then, of course, the ones on the flip side that say, you know, no, we're not going to do any advertising. It's all whatever you want. Um, the truth of the matter is what we're seeing from our customers across the board is that they're very judiciously and, and intentionally 
intentionally testing their way into that and figuring out that balance to the user of, yes, how long is the content, how valuable is the content, how recent is the content, and, and making sure that the length of ads and the number of ads in that content is aligned with those expectations. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it, with the thing about the web is things can move so quickly. If you're, you know, if you're doing something that the user community just doesn't tolerate anymore and there's an easy alternative next door, it's, quick, it's a quick move. I mean, some sort of empirical data, I mean, there's a, there's a big you know, movie trailer site out there and the slogan of the site is where pre-roll goes to die. They don't do any pre-roll advertising. They do bumpers and, and some, some small things. Now they're willing to do that for how long? Who knows? It's all about you know. At some point, they need to, to make a profit. But you know, you could easily see how their audience would would get would shelled if you've gotten them used to something, and then all of a sudden you're putting three ads in, in front of each you know in each each trailer. So, I think it, it definitely has to be a judicious move to to kind of measure audience. But at the same time, it's going to happen. People are going to increase ad load because there's need, there's money to be made. Um, so I think if we if we do it smartly and if we come up with innovative products, um, we can do so without damaging the core business, which is that audience. You, pr I mean, you probably have to struggle with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a relevant question, right? I mean, I, I, there's up in the ad load and long form and short form are very different questions, right? Um, and we'll trust CBS and Hulu to figure out what they think their optimal is. In theory, that's entirely data driven, right? They should be able to look at effectiveness and figure it out. Short form is hard, right? Because we have this major competitor called YouTube who has been in the business over the last four years of not putting pre-roll there in a meaningful way. And when they introduce their first pre-roll product, they say basically, again, it's like a commandment. Skip this ad now. I think it actually says now. Which is like, talk about, you know, this is like how you empower yourself in the morning, right? You put something on the mirror and after a while you believe it. You skip the ad Personal now. mantra. Um, but it's, uh, but it, it is hard, right? Because we, we load, I would say, my guess is around 20% of our short form videos have a pre-roll in front of it. It's, you said 0.5%? Less of it. Less than 0.5% yeah. on YouTube. It's hard to compete that way because a lot of the reason, it, and when we, we look at uh, younger audiences in particular, they're like, yeah, I go to YouTube because they don't have ads, and when I see an ad, I just click refresh or skip to another video, right? They, they're, they're, they've been trained very well by YouTube not to, to, uh, to, to, to wait for a pre-roll. Well, YouTube's banking on being able to charge much more for the ability to, to generate wanted views of, of content, of, of, of advertising, right? So if the market moves toward paying a, a premium CPM for the ability to skip the ad being offered and, and to get true views, then, then publishers like, like the ones we work with and unlike yourselves will, will adjust to that. But it's going to be a difficult dynamic because, you know, media buying is all about you know, at, at the end day, the only thing that's true and certain, even with all this data, is rate. And you know, people will sacrifice proven performance for a cheaper CPM. So hopefully, YouTube can raise CPMs for everybody. But no, I, I think that's true. But if it says, if if even if I think the ad is relevant, you give me the choice to skip it. I'm probably skipping it because I came to watch another video, right? So I mean, there's I think there's a balance here. Well, I mean, that 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 points back to the little question that. If you run a pre-roll, I mean, not to, to shake up the panel, but if you run a pre-roll um, and you get 100% completion, does it actually show that they, they really had intention to watch your, your ad, or is the intention just to watch what's following your ad? Um, and and that, that came back to what you spoke about earlier today, saying um, let's, let's expand the boundaries of understanding how we do measurement in advertising and, and understand how we can be different, because I don't think we should hold ourselves to to, I guess, these limitations that's, that's been pushed upon us in some way or another from, from broadcasting. Any questions before we wrap here? I think we're about to the post launch. All right. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Thank you, panel.